Chapter 5 of A Short History of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. A Short History of Wales by Owen M. Edwards. Chapter 5 The Welsh Kings. The spirit of Rome remained, though Rome itself had fallen, and Welsh kings rose to take the place of the Roman ruler trying to force the tribes of Wales, of different races and tongues, to become one people. The chief Roman ruler, at any rate, during the later wars against the invaders, was called Dux Britannia, the ruler of Britain. It became the aim of the ablest kings to restore the power of this officer, and to carry on his work, to rule and defend a united country. And I will tell you briefly how the kings ruled and defended Wales for more than five hundred years, how Melguin tried to unite it, how Rodri tried to prevent the attacks of Saxon and Dane, how Hal gave it laws, and how Griffith tried to defend it against England. Between 400 and 450 Rome left Wales to look after itself. An able family, called the House of Cunetha, took the power of the Dux Britannia, and they translated the title into Gwiladig, the ruler of a Gwilad country. Of this family, Melguin Gwyneth is the most famous. It was his work to try to unite all the smaller kings or chiefs of Wales under his own power as the Island Dragon. It was a difficult thing to persuade them. They all wanted to be independent. A legend shows that Melguin tried to guile as well as force. The kings met him at Aberdovi, and they all sat in their royal chairs on the sands. And Melguin said, let him be king over all who can sit longest on his chair as the tide comes in. But he had made his own chair of bird's wings, and it floated erect when all the other chairs had been thrown down. Before Maelgwyn died of the Yellow Plague in 547, his strong arm had made Wales one united country, and had made every corner of it Christian. The new wave of nations, coming on as surely as the tide, began to beat against Wales. The Picts came from the northern parts of Britain, and Teutonic tribes swarmed across the eastern sea. The Angles came to the Humber, and spread over the plains of the north and the midlands of Roman Britain. The Saxons came to the Thames, and won the plains and the downs of the southeast. In 577 the Saxons, after the Battle of Durham, pierced to the western sea at the mouth of the Severn. They crept up along the valley of the Severn, burning the great Roman towns. Before they reached Chester and the Dee, however, they were defeated at the Battle of Fethenley in 584. But the Angles soon appeared from the north, and after their victory at Chester in 613, they won the plains right to the Irish Sea. Wales was now surrounded on the land side by a people who spoke strange languages, and who worshipped different gods, for the Angles and the Saxons were heathens. From the sea, also, it was open to attack. Sometimes the Irish came, but the most feared of all were the Danes, whose sudden appearance and quick movements and desperate onslaughts were the terror of the age. The Black Danes came from the fords of Norway, the White Danes from the plains of Sweden and Denmark. The Danes settled on the south coast. Tenby is a Danish name. Offa, the king of the Mercian Angles, took the rich lands between the Severn and the Wye. But Offa's dyke, Cloth Offa, is probably the work of some earlier people whose history has been lost. It was only by incessant fighting that the enemy could be kept at bay. Of all the kings who tried to defend his country against the enemies which now stood round it, the greatest is Rodri, called Rodri Mar the Great. From 844 to 877, by battles on sea and land, he broke the spell of Danish and Saxon victories, and his might and wisdom enabled him to lead his country in those dark days. Like Alfred of Wessex, who lived at the same time and faced the same task, he stemmed the torrent of Danish invasion and beat the sea rovers on their own element. Like Alfred, he left warlike children and grandchildren. One of the grandsons was Howell the Good, who put the laws of Wales down in a book. Wales and England were now, both of them in their own way, trying to become one country. 
it was seen by many that strength and peace were better than division and war in england the earls of mercia and wessex tried to rise into supreme power in wales llewellyn ab Cecil, victorious in many battles and wishing for peace made the country rich and happy still when he died in 1022 the princes said they would not obey another over king but the long ships full of danes came again the angles crossed the severn war and misery took the place of peace and plenty griffith the son of llewellyn came to renew his father's work in the battle of ride e grows on the severn in 1039 he drove the mercians back in the battle of pencater in 1041 he crushed the opponents of welsh unity in 1044 he defeated the sea rovers at abertawi at the same time harold earl of wessex was making himself king of england a war broke out between griffith and harold and during it in 1063 the great welsh king the head and the shield of the britons was slain by traitors so far i have told you about a few only the greatest kings of the house of cunetha i know that you are wondering where arthur comes in i am not quite sure that arthur ever really lived except in the mind of many ages he is the spirit of roman rule the true dux britannia and he is all the greatness and ability of all the race of cunetha i have been shown mountains under which he sleeps with his knights around him waiting for the time when his country is to be delivered let us hope that what arthur represents courage and wisdom love of country and love of right lives in the hearts of his people end of chapter five